Today, on the very first episode of The Restore Show, I'm going to be talking about my rebuttal to possibly the worst article in the history of the internet on old houses. Plus, I'm going to be doing some myth-busting on old houses, old windows, and energy efficiency. That's all coming up here on The Restore Show. All right, this week I had the painful experience of reading an article on the Atlantic that can only be found in America as the fruits of Common Core math begin sprouting in the minds of young journalists today. On the journalistic scale of 1 to 10, this one came in at a solid negative 126. It may sound like an arbitrary number, but I can assure you the number has merit, unlike this story. The article was called Stop Fetishizing Old Homes by M. Nolan Gray, apparently attempting to capitalize on the M. Night Shyamalan uh, first initial only name game that made his movie so riveting. Who is M. Nolan Gray, you may ask? Well, according to his bio, he is a professional city planner and housing researcher at UCLA. He is also the author of the upcoming book, certain to be a staple on every bookshelf, mine included, called Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. I've pre-ordered my copy, and you can too, at bookshop.org. The thesis of the article is that America has an unhealthy obsession with old houses, which in the author's eloquent words, quote-unquote, just kind of sucks. A clearly definable statement that is not subjective at all. He posits that new construction is, quote, better on nearly every conceivable measure, and, quote, one hears a lot of self-righteous discussion about the need for more preservation, end quote. On a more serious note, I'm not sure how he discovered the rotating top-secret righteous club meetings that I and other preservation influencers have, but I'm determined to get to the bottom of the leak. Negative 21 points for snooping. He continues, Old housing is simply less safe, end quote, due to lead paint and lead pipes. He also cites improper aging wiring and these buildings' lack of building materials needed to stop a blaze as a fire hazard. You know, unlike the newer, better stuff like vinyl siding and spray foam, which are so flammable that it takes little more than my ex-girlfriend walking by to be ignited by that old flame. Negative 35 points for fire misinformation, Mr. Gray. What struck me most was not the audacity and smugness of writing an article about how anyone can disagree with you is clearly out of their mind. Clearly us old housers suffer from lead poisoning, which makes us cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But what really chapped my hide was the utter disregard of facts and lack of real world experience. One of the immeasurable improvements the Honorable Mr. Gray cites is the how, quote, noise is appropriately recognized as one of the biggest quality of life issues in cities, end quote, and how new buildings get this right while old buildings almost always have no noise dampening features. Not only is this verifiably untrue, which anyone who has lived in a home with one inch thick plaster walls that block not only my voice, but stop the Wi-Fi signal from five feet away, but the opposite is the more typical the case. He lays lavish praise on his former home, a mid 2000s apartment in DC that had such excellent sound blocking due to fiberglass insulation. Clearly the gold standard of sound blocking to Mr. Gray. Don't misunderstand me, I'm truly happy for him that he found a, an apartment, the one apartment building in America where sound blocking was done effectively, unlike every other apartment the rest of us have lived in, where your 23-year-old neighbor feels obligated to keep you awake until 1 a.m. with another rendition of Dirty Pop. True story, and God bless NSYNC. Negative 42 points for keeping me awake, Mr. Gray. Seriously, has this man lived in any of the modern housing the rest of us have? wood trim that falls apart faster than a Hollywood marriage, double pane windows that fog faster than my shower door, and mold growth that, well, let's say most of today's housing stock reminds me of a four week old loaf of bread on a Floridian kitchen counter. But the piece de resistance of the whole article is when he describes the final solution for the old house fetishizers of America, a new club I fully intend to start. The solution, the Japanese model where homes are torn down after only 30 years and thrown in the landfill, AKA Tokyo Bay. And new homes are built to replace them. This, he believes, results in a, quote, new house with all the modern amenities and design innovation that entails. Yeah. As someone who lived in Japan for nearly a year, I can assure you that Japanese home construction is not something that America will cherish. 
Japanese houses are made with possibly some of the cheapest prefabbed materials on earth and provide the lowest quality of life I've experienced. It's kind of like living in the packing material that your electronics come with. Most middle class Japanese houses were built with materials that wouldn't make the quality cut at IKEA. Negative 28 points for making me reference IKEA. Add all those up and you get negative 126 points on our journalistic rating. It's clear that facts are fickle things that come only sparingly across the desk of Mr. Gray, much like a unicorn bathing by the moonlight. As someone who shows such concern for climate issues as Mr. Gray does, throughout this article I would think that proposing the solution of raising and dumping what would amount to trillions of metric tons of waste into our landfills and pulling the equal amount of materials out of the earth each year to replace those old houses would cause the error function on his mental calculator, but apparently that function has been disabled on the Ocasio-Cortezian model he operates on. This article proves once again that people who have never lived in an old house should not be trusted to make decisions about what we as a country should do with our old houses. So as someone who has been inside more old houses than Hugh Hefner has Playboy bunnies, let me say that there is only one final solution for old houses. If you want an old house, you should buy an old house. If you want a new house, then by all means you should buy a new house. Neither group has any say in a free country like this about how other people choose to live their lives and in what kind of home they choose to live those lives. And if you can't do math, then stop promoting a policy where 2 plus 2 equals zebra. And that's today's Soapbox. All right, it's time to do some myth busting. What we're going to talk about today are energy efficient windows and other myths. Um, windows are probably the biggest focus of anybody on old houses. I can't buy an old house because the windows are drafty, inefficient, costing me thousands of dollars each year. And I have written extensively about this on thecraftsmanblog.com. If you want to check it out, go check that out right now. Go to thecraftsmanblog.com, search windows, replacement windows, any of that stuff. There's a ton of facts out there in the world. And these are not my facts because there's no such thing as my facts or your facts. There are just the facts. And so what we're going to do today is lay out some of the facts. You can make the decisions with that however you would like. So let's dispel the myth right off. Windows are not energy efficient. You know, even the quintuple pane, eight inch thick, bulletproof portal window, it's still a window. It's not designed to be energy efficient. So some stats for you. So walls on a house are recommended depending on where you live in America, the climate zone, and there's different places for those of you outside of the states. But walls are recommended to be insulated between R15 and R21. That's the best recommendations, they say. It's going to give you the best performance on a house. Windows are value, and there are other ratings like SHGC, which is your shade uh, coefficient. There's also a U factor, how much radiant heat, things like that. But the R value, if we're comparing R value of a window to a wall, the R value of the average window is between 1 for a single pane window and 3 for the top of the line stuff. Now. There are outliers before I get comments uh, down below that say, hi, there's this window that's R5. Yes, there are some extremely expensive Ferrari type windows that can go up to R5. Those are triple or quadruple pane, argon filled, usually out of the price range of most average homeowners. But for most of us who are gonna get, go from a single pane to a double pane, you're gonna go from a one, maybe a 0.9 R value to a 2.3, 2.5 is pretty typical. The highest I've seen on a residential window that's not super specialty is like 3.2. So still not a huge improvement, right? You can double that, right? I've doubled, doubled my R value in my window by replacing them, but you've still gone from one to two or from two to three. Not a huge improvement. That's like doubling the gas mileage on my Toyota Tundra from 10 to 20. I'm still not winning any competitions for gas mileage. So windows were designed for two things, and two things only, ventilation and admittance of light. So your house doesn't feel like a cave, we came up with windows. Before there were windows, there were just openings in the wall and shutters to keep the weather and stuff out. Then we said, hey, it would be better if we could invent this thing called glass that would allow light to come in, and when we want to open it, we can open it. So that's how windows came about. Windows were never designed to be something energy efficient. Cavemen had a big cave, didn't have any windows, not a problem. Of course, they didn't have any energy costs and they both, they all lived till about 15 or 20, but windows were not a problem there. There's a few things on a house that are not meant for energy efficiency. Air conditioning for one. I'm down here in Orlando, Florida. Air conditioning is not something that I'm willing to give up, 
but I also know that about 70% of my energy use on my home is from the air conditioner. Is that something I should surrender in the name of saving climate change or saving on my energy bills? No, I'm not willing to live in Florida without air conditioning. I'm also not willing to live in a house without a window. And while I think you should have a window that's as efficient as you can afford or works most effectively for you to get ventilation and light into your house, it doesn't mean that a window itself is an energy efficient moment, an energy efficient material. There's nothing about windows that makes them energy efficient. So let's talk about some stats, some facts. According to Angie's List, the average cost of a new ENERGY STAR window is around $600. Yes, yes, there are the Window World specials for $199 installed. There are also several windows out there you can find by companies, say, like Renewal by Anderson for $2,300, $2,500 a window. So the average is around $600. You can find everything in between those two ranges, too. And according to energystar.gov, the average savings of that window, so this is upgrading from a single pane window to a double pane Energy Star rated window, the average savings of that window each year over a single pane is $15. Now, those of you with calculators are doing the math right now. Hopefully, you don't have the kind of calculator that Mr. Gray has from earlier. But I'll do it for you. That's 40 years. Now, even if I'm half wrong, that's 20 years. 20-year payback. You're talking about, I need to save on my energy bills. So I'm going to go spend, on an average house, $600 a window, 20 windows, do that math, and then I'm going to save $15 in each window. It's going to take you between 20 at the, even if I'm half wrong, to 40 if I'm spot on. And it could be worse than that, right? Maybe it's you're in a place where you've got shady, uh, shady covering on your window, so you're not gonna have as much. You've got big oak trees over your house or something like that. You're not gonna get as much saving from those windows if they're in the shade or depending on your climate. Are you in Maine or are you in Nashville? Both of those things make a difference. So let's say 40 years. 40 years of payback. Is there any other investment that you would do where you would wait 40 years to get a payback of the principal, not a gain, right? We invest for the future to say, we're gonna invest, and when I retire in 40 years, I'm going to have more money. I put in $100,000 over my lifetime into my IRA, and when I retire, wow, it's worth a million dollars. I got more than that. But what if I said I put in $100,000 on year one, and by the time I retire in 40 years, I got that $100,000 back? Nobody does that. It makes absolutely zero financial sense. And so this myth that windows are an energy efficient feature or that you could buy an energy efficient window, it's so pervasive, the marketing from these companies. You'll save 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% on your energy bills. I've even seen the ones 50% on your energy bills. Now granted, those companies got sued and uh, had to change their marketing because windows, first off, only account for 10 to 20% of the entire heating bill of the home. And by swapping out your windows, you're saving 10 to 20% of the 10 to 20%. Not a huge savings, but you can play with the statistics. There's a great book for those of you who haven't read it uh, from the 1950s, I believe, called How to Lie with Statistics. It's on the recommended reading for like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, everybody, and I've read it as well. And it's not like a, um, you know, a, a book teaching you how to be an evil person, but it is a great book for if you want to learn how people, especially say, you know, politicians or companies will lie about it, you have to pay attention to how the statistics are laid out. Save 20% on your energy costs. And then in small print, on the window portion of your heating costs or on the heating portion of your heating costs. But, it's a portion of a portion of a portion. So 20% is huge. Same thing, double the efficiency of your windows. You went from R1 to R2. It's not the huge savings that you think it is. So think of it like this. When you're paying to double the R value of your windows, by replacing it with a double pane, energy, double pane window, right? You've doubled it. You're going from one to two points. Doubling always sounds good, but doubling your money say at blackjack. I always like to use this example for people. If you double your money at blackjack, are you an incredible blackjack player? Well, it depends. Did you sit down with $50,000 and walk away with $100,000 because you were so good at it? Or did you, like I did when I went to Vegas, sit down with $10 and walk away with 20 and be happy that you got a free beer? So doubling your money may be something important if it's a decent amount of money. Doubling the energy efficiency of windows, never important because it's not a huge amount. So going from one to two, or going from one to three to triple the energy efficiency of your windows still doesn't really move the needle on that. 
So before you go replace your windows, think about it. Make the decision based on math, not based on marketing and not based on feelings. And it's that simple. So you've got an old house, it's got old windows. You're thinking, well, he just told me not to replace my windows. It's not gonna make them that energy efficient. What could you possibly do to improve the efficiency of your old windows? I'm glad you asked. It's quite simple. There's a slew of options for you. Let's start with number one, restoration. Can you restore your old windows? Absolutely you can restore your old windows. I've found that just about any window built before 1960, say, and there are some exceptions in the 60s, but not a ton, but anything built before then was typically putty glazed and designed in a way that it could be restored. It was built with old growth lumber, which is a premium building material. It was built in a way that it was meant to be maintained. And that's the key to it. Some of these windows, once you get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and of course all of them today, if something breaks or goes wrong, there's just, you've got to order that proprietary part from Anderson or Pella or Marvin or wherever it is, or you just can't really fix it. There's nothing much that can be done. So restoration is key. I've got tons of uh, information on that. If you want to go check out my course, go to thewindowcourse.com. I'll walk you through the steps of restoration, top to bottom, start to finish. You're going to learn everything you need, A to Z, I don't think that there's anything after Z, right? So A to Z plus some extra bonuses. You get some free stuff if you sign up for the course that are make it pretty much pay for the course itself. But re learn to restore your windows. Scrape the paint off, repair the rot if there is some, reglaze them, that's a big part of it. On an old historic window, let me explain just a little anatomy real quick. You have each pane of glass. They're all individual panes of glass and they're held in place by glazing points, but they're also held in place by glazing putty. And that glazing putty seals out water and air. If you have glazing putty that's fallen out, that's gotten old and brittle and fallen out, then you have air coming in around those pieces of glass. It's a very simple process. You may not be the greatest glazer ever, but simply reglazing, putting new putty on those windows will seal the water out and will sear the air out. So less drafts and it costs you dollars, individual dollars, two, three, four, five dollars. You can get a bucket of glazing putty for like fifty dollars and it can do almost I don't know, half of a house of windows by just, you know, spot glazing and things like that. Another simple thing you can do are hardware adjustments, right? A lot of old houses, you have the, uh, the hardware, the sash locks or a casement window, the, the, the uh, adjusters or the latch are not fit properly and so the window doesn't close all the way. No window, whether it's a brand new window or an old window, that's slightly ajar is going to be, in a, is going to be efficient. So can you make it more efficient by closing it? Absolutely. Scrape some of that excess paint away, adjust the latch so it closes and catches, make the sweep work on a double hung window. You have a meeting rail. You can adjust those, make sure it closes tightly and pulls everything snugly. Adjust the stops on the inside of your window if they're loose. If you've got loose windows, there are simple adjustments you can make to them. Can you do that on new windows? Not so much. There's not a lot of adjustment for them. It's one of the great things about these old windows. They're repairable, they're maintainable, they're adjustable. You can tweak them to your house just because your neighbor's house was slightly different doesn't mean that their window needs to be exactly the same. You can make those adjustments to your house that has settled a little bit more than that neighbor who has the same window. These windows are infinitely adjustable. Another simple option to do is weather stripping. Man, if you have windows that are not weather stripped, a lot of us down here in Florida have no weather stripping because let's face it, when these houses were built in the 19 teens and 1930s and 1920s and all that, there was no need for weather stripping because there was no air conditioning. The windows were open pretty much 24 seven and they weren't trying to keep the cold air out because there was no cold air down here. Now granted today it's probably in the 60s so we're all freezing and everybody's wearing toboggans and scarves, but that's just because Floridians are crazy and I'm one of them. That's why I have the flannel on today. All that aside, weather stripping is key. Things like spring bronze, integrated metal weather stripping, even simple things like felt or bulb weather stripping can be added to your windows, really dramatically increase the efficiency of your windows. So don't rule out weather stripping. If you spend $100 to weather strip a window, that's way less than if you should do any other kind of option on here. And I think weather stripping is usually one of the best ways you can go. So the other thing you can do is you can add storms. Add a storm window on the outside to protect the prime window from the weather, but also add it on the inside. There are interior storms, things like Indo, Interglass, um, Magnetite, there's a bunch of different companies. There's also a bunch of companies that will build you exterior storm windows, whether it's aluminum or wood or historic storm windows. People in the past were not blind to the idea of a storm window. 
The storm window was that double pane efficiency. It just didn't have gas in it that would, see, that would seep out and fail and fog up. Your storm window fogged up, you just opened the storm, wiped it down, and closed it again. Plus, you get about, I don't know, three inches, four inches of airspace between your window and your storm, as opposed to a quarter of inch of airspace in an IGU. That airspace is all insulation, baby. You need to take advantage of that. So really, if you don't have storm windows, consider adding them. Even if it's something that's ugly, like a triple track storm window, people tend to hate those and they're complaining about them. They're still doing something to make your windows more efficient and to protect your window from the weather. So think about that. Another simple one. People miss this all the time. Curtains. Curtains, you don't have to have a bare window. Using heavy curtains for the, for the winter, or if you're down here in the south, use heavy curtains in the summer when you want to keep the heat out. That makes a world of difference. There are thermal drapes. There's all kinds of window coverings, cellular shades, all kinds of window treatments you can put on the inside of your window to not only give you privacy, but they're also going to give you, you guessed it, energy efficiency. So simple upgrade, much less expensive, much less of a pain in the butt than replacing your window. And now you've gone from that R1 window we were talking about to an R3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, even up to 10 with uh, windows with, say, cellular shades and thermal drapes. You can be approaching the same energy efficiency that your wall is if you put some of these window treatments on. And it doesn't require you replacing that character-defining historic window or just even in a simple old single-pane window that is in good shape and doesn't need to be replaced at the moment. Another thing that people often don't think about are seasonal air sealing things. There are things like rope caulk. There is a um, Red Devil makes a caulk that you can apply around the perimeter of the interior perimeter of your window. That's seasonal. You put it on in say you know November whenever it gets cold by you, and then in the spring, March, April when it warms up, you just peel it off, and then you can operate your window again for the time while it's sealed up with rope caulk or that caulk. It, you really can't operate the window, but then again, are most of us in the winter opening our windows all the time? Probably not. And for those of you in the southern climate like me, a lot of us use it in the summer because God knows I don't open my windows in the summer at all. It's just too hot and it's unbearable. So something to think about there. Paint. It may sound simple, but simply painting and caulking your windows around the trim, keeping them in good shape, keeps the gaps sealed up, keeps the wood protected, helps them last longer, saves you money. Maybe it's not saving you money on your energy bills, but it's saving you maintenance money, saving you restoration costs, extending the life of your windows. All simple, simple things you can do. So don't discount the fact that there are things you can do to make your windows more efficient, more energy efficient, less wasteful. But ultimately, like we've talked about, the window is not an energy efficient material. It's not a part of the building that's gonna be an energy efficient part. It just, it, it just doesn't. Let's not make it what it is. It's like trying to turn a pickup truck into a race car or a race car into a pickup truck. They excel. Certain things excel at what they're supposed to do. My pickup truck can haul trailers, can haul tools, but I'm certainly not going to go buy a Ferrari and try and do that same stuff with it. They're meant for different things. They're designed for different things. Let's let them be what they are and help them shine in their own way. I hope I've been able to dispel and bust some myths for you, help you understand your historic windows a little bit more, and have a little bit of fun with, uh, you know, some of those misinformation articles floating around the internet. Never forget, restoration is possible, and demolition is a choice. Thanks. Thanks.